Welcome to Bad to Talks Community Chats. I'm Brenda Gonzalez, Director of Community Relations for UW-Madison. I'm excited to be back with a series that explores different perspectives on community and university connections. This was developed in the spirit of Lamar Billups Community University Engagement Awards, which recognizes outstanding contributions to campus community partnerships. Community Chats features leaders at the forefront of social change in Madison. As part of this series, we are lucky to have Kaleem Kerr joining us today. If you don't know Kaleem, let me just tell you a little bit about him. Kaleem is the founder and CEO of One City Early Learning Centers, a 21st century preschool and elementary school in Madison. He will tell us more about the developments that are recently happening, significantly aiming to eliminate the racial achievement gaps. As most of you know, his tireless advocacy and efforts inspired the creation of UW-Madison's People Program, the Information Technology Academy, ITA, Madison Metropolitan School District's Nuestro Mundo Bilingual Charter School, and the Schools of Hope Tutoring Program. Kalim currently serves on the UW School of Education Madison Education Partnership Steering Committee. Hi, Kalim. Thank you for joining us today. Glad to be here. Thank you. I am so excited that you're here. I, I can't wait for you to share a little bit about uh, everything that you're doing from not only what has happened to all of us during COVID last year, uh, but also I know that you probably have news and how the school One City and your team is growing and how you are really focusing on the school success leadership for our, ch our children. Uh, so I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about what um, has um, you have been up to in your team. Uh, yeah, great, happy to. So we started One City Schools in 2014 as an organization. And in 2015, we took a year and in 2015, we had raised enough money to uh, kick off our preschool. So we started with children as young as one years old, all the way through age four. And a year later, we added um, some additional capacity and we moved into a new building. And so we went from six children to 16 to 52 with 70 children on a wait list for our preschool. And then the University of Wisconsin system was given the ability to charter schools, charter public schools by the uh, Wisconsin legislature. And so we ended up becoming one of the first uh, public charter schools authorized by the UW system in 2018. And now we're serving children as young as age two, all the way through second grade. Uh, this coming fall, when a new school year starts, we'll have students in third and fourth grade as well. And by 2024, we will end up having students ages two all the way through 12th grade. And so we're really excited about that. But our mission is to see the new model of public education in America, where all of our children are truly prepared to succeed in colleges and careers when they graduate from high school. And so our uh, preschool has an award-winning international model called Anji Play. Um, it's out of Anji, China. We were the first school outside of mainland China to be invited to take this program on. So we have a very close um, and important partnership with them. And then uh, we have a, a project-based learning program for our elementary students, and that's affiliated with, with Expeditionary Learning or EL Education. They're um, the cornerstone of project-based learning in America, and we're one of their affiliate schools. And then uh, we'll be starting what will be the state's first true early college and career secondary school where we'll have kids in sixth through 12th grade, but all of our children will begin taking college classes as early as 10th grade, with some of them completing a minimum of a year to two of their college education before they leave our doors. So we're really excited about it. Um, it's going to help us move a lot more of our children, the diversity of our children forward educationally and in the professions in our community. Absolutely. And it's important that we have this relationship with UW to help us do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you so much for all of that summary. I know there's a lot more behind all of that work. So I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about uh, who helps you make some of those decisions in terms of your board, maybe, and also your staff. I know that you're growing, you're hiring uh, people. What is your team uh, composition? How do they look like? So currently we have 46 team members. We have 15 board members. Um, both are, we have a diversity of people on our board and on our uh, staff, and we're still working on that. Really excited about the team members that we're bringing in this fall. 
and we'll grow to a staff of 59 people. Um, we have um, every, everyone you could think of that looks like Madison, we will have on our team. Um, and uh, the diversity of our team is significantly more than you've probably seen any other school in Dane County. Um, so we're really excited about that. We have 15 members on our board. Um, our board is very diverse. We have uh, Dr. Gloria Latson billings who is a, a former member of the faculty at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, heralded internationally for being one of the world's top educators um, and really is a cornerstone behind cultural, uh, the, the creator of culturally relevant pedagogy in America. Uh, we also have uh, Scott Klug, who's just recently joined our board. He's a former U.S. congressman representing the Madison area. And then we have uh, Mr. Noble Ray, who is our board chair, along with a number of other people um, in our community who've done some pretty extraordinary things. So, you know, we really feel great about the team that we have, but it's also the partnerships that make up who we are. And we have very deep partnerships with the University of Wisconsin system including Madison. So besides a system administration, uh, chartering our school and working hand in hand with us, we have partnerships with the universities, uh, UW-Madison School of Education. It's a nursing mm -hmm. program, School of Human Ecology. And uh, we're starting to extend additional tentacles into other areas such as the business school. And so, you know, we're really excited about it. It's one city. It's all about the whole community coming together to do great things for children. And the university is a big part of that community. So we're proud to have all the people that we do on board with us. That is right. I, I'm so glad that you mentioned not only the trajectory in terms of like your team and your board, but also the networks and the connections and the collaborations that you're able to foster with other organizations, larger institutions and other industry. Uh, I wonder if you can tell me a little bit about two very uh, powerful projects that I know that you and One City uh, were involved, the Early Care and Education for All um, coalition that you were able to form or be part of. And the second one that I think ties to now seems like not past history yet, just yet with COVID-19 testing at one city. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the Rockefeller study. Yeah. So let me start with the COVID testing. So when, you know, COVID shut down everything uh, mm -hmm. a year ago in March, uh, we were forced, like everyone else, to figure out how we were going to continue to educate students and support families and our staff. And uh, as we made our way through the summer, we were looking for how could we ensure we could bring our students back to school in September with the school year starting and feel um, that we were able to keep everybody safe. And so we have a board member, Dr. Wajia Akhtar Khalil. She is an epidemiologist, works at the university. She said she heard about a group of researchers who were trying to find a place to do their work, their research work with a saliva test. And so we reached out to them and uh, we were able to connect with uh, this team and work with them on how we could do first uh, a testing program where we could kind of get our feet wet with it to be a part of their research study where they were looking at, you know, how can we use saliva to test for COVID? Because it is a reliable way to assess, do people have it? And then if they, if we feel that they might have it, we would send it to their lab for further PCR testing, which is more of the gold standard of testing for things like that. And so it grew out of a month along of trial and error with them to then building a pop-up lab within our school. So we became the only public, only school, public or private, in the state of Wisconsin that had a COVID testing lab on site at our building. And so we started to test both our staff and students twice a week and um, would send those samples if we found any evidence to uh, UW. But what, what ended up happening was we were able to keep our school open all year long. We've only had four instances where we've had to close schools um, because we found COVID. But none of those COVID um, diagnoses have traced back to actually starting at our school. They all came from somewhere else within our ecosystem. And so uh, we got recognition we, uh, from that. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation was doing a study of schools that had uh, reopened. And they wanted to use it as a way to educate others about reopening. And when they heard about what we had done, they were so shocked by it. They um, they made us one of the 10 organizations or schools that they featured nationwide in their study. So it was a really good feature. 
in that study that the Rand Corporation did for them. And then um, with the uh, edu- ex- uh, early care and education for all program, you know, our focus has been this reinventing public education it starts with early education. We believe that early childhood education should be free and high quality to every child in America. And what we're trying to do is say in Wisconsin, let's create the model for that. And so we built these partnerships with some amazing organizations, including the University, the Wisconsin Early Childhood Association, the United Way of Dane County um, and others. And we came together and said, you know, there was a um, W.K. Kellogg Foundation grant on racial equity 2030 is what it was called. And they were looking for transformational agendas, uh, initiatives that they could put their millions, millions of dollars behind to help move things forward. And so we found out about it late, but we came together, brought all these partners together to say, what could we do to help move early, early child education forward in Wisconsin? And what we all realized was that, you know, there is no system for early childhood in Wisconsin. There's just, there are organizations that authorize early childhood centers. There are people who provide it, but there's no real system for driving the quality of it or addressing the issues of not having highly paid enough teachers, not having enough resources to fund families. So we said, let's come together and create that system because in absence of that, we don't feel we could get the state to support something. So the role of, of and goal of that effort is to create a model system for early care and education right here in Dane County, and then use that as a piece we can research using researchers at the university and mm-hmm. elsewhere to justify a further expansion statewide and from there potentially nationally. So our job was the catalyst to bring those folks together, but it is a broader partnership with a lot of other partners. Our main partner being the um, Center for Research and Early Childhood Education Mm -hmm. at UW-Madison and then our uh, community coordinated childcare here in Dane County. That is pretty amazing, uh, Kaleem. I think it is so important to remember how there's so many things that are happening uh, that sometimes we don't hear about. So how to make sure that we're informed uh, and that we recognize and celebrate some of the wins, right? Um, So, and that makes me think a little bit about, of course, the work uh, you have been recognized uh, for this legacy, Lamar Billups uh, Award. Um, And a lot of the work that you're doing to me seem like it's completely related to of course, the Lamar Billups um, legacy that he left here in Madison. For those who may not be familiar with Lamar and his legacy, Lamar Billups served as a special assistant to two UW chancellors and was director of community relations from 1996 to 2007. Lamar was known as a skilled ambassador between the university and the city and was deeply committed, committed to key civic institutions and social causes. Kaleem, is there something that you can think of and highlight the way that you're working, the way the Lamar that I know you knew well, uh, that you can highlight and make the connections? Because I think that the work that you're doing uh, certainly speaks to that idea that I think Lamar wanted all of us to really understand and move forward. Is there anything that you can share? Yeah, just, you know, the main thing is how I got back to Madison. It was because of Lamar Billups. It was 100 percent because of him. Um, And then it was uh, people like Annette Miller, who's uh, very instrumental in my coming back as well. But Lamar had left uh, Madison and moved out to Washington, D.C., where I happen to be living. And we we reconnect. We, you know, we connected there. But one day I was driving home from work. And I was on Kenilworth Avenue driving to get to Highway 50 to get to Bowie, Maryland, where my house was. And I got a call from Lamar. I always picked up his always picked the phone when he called. And he told me, Kaleem, there's a job waiting for you back in Madison. And he had already told me how the community, some of the leaders had really cried when I left Madison before because they saw me as being an important future leader for the city. And uh, he was constantly talking to me about opportunities to come back. And I wasn't opposed to coming back to Madison. It just wasn't the right things that he was putting in front of me. But I told him the only thing I would ever come back for was the Urban League job. So when that job came open, he called me. And I was surprised that the job was open because I had just been back home and it donated bricks to this new uh, money to buy a brick for this new building that, that was erected. And, um, you know, we talked. I pulled over on the side of that busy highway. And then he was then the full court press was on to get me to come home. And uh, he made sure that 
everybody who needed to talk to me um, in this community and even in DC <laughs> were talking to me about coming back home. People don't know that this man called my former boss, uh, Joe Robert, who was the chairman and founder of Fight for Children in Washington, DC, because they met each other through his, his work at Georgetown and to try to convince him to have me come back to Madison. And so his, his influence was significant in my life, but also his ability to talk to a person like Joe Robert and others to get them just to con connect, to help mush me to this point. And then when I came back home, um, his fraternity, Omega Psi Phi, um, I had gentlemen pull me aside and like, brother, we're here for you. Brother Lamar said, we gotta take care of you. Um, we gotta help you and your family make this transition. And they have done all of those things and they continue to stand by my side to this day. Um, but he had also other people in Madison poised to help me get where I needed you know, to move forward and just replant myself here. And his his influence was serious in the city. The mayor, Mayor Dave, Dave Cheslevich, um, we got together, I think my first week or two here, and he had helped Dave with his transition. And he said, Mar Mar Lamar said, I need to do X. I need to figure out what your agenda is going to be and be supportive. And mm -hmm. Mayor Dave was supportive of everything I put in front of him. And so, you know, not only did he recruit me back, he paved the way for me to be successful here. And I continue to appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. You are talking about how we need to make community, how we need to um, connect the dots, support uh, within uh, our different institutions, our different projects. But so I wonder if you can think about what do you think Lamar is thinking right now about what is happening here in Madison, in this nation, but in particularly here in Madison, with all of the social and racial issues that we're facing and, and you know, thinking about what his legacy is, what he thought maybe the future could hold and, and bringing you in, right? The leaders that we need uh, to hear uh, strong voices from. Um, so is there anything that you think this is what I know this is what I need to be doing and more because of, as you are saying, because of Lamar, because of his legacy. But what else do we need to hear from you? What what else uh, do we need to hear from the leaders in our community? You know, Lamar built people to build community. You know, he really saw the importance of individuals being the ones that drive change, influence change. And he was like the kingmaker, the queenmaker. He was like the one who stood behind us and to make things happen for us while at the same time, you know, challenging our thinking always in very diplomatic and reasonable ways. But, you know, he was, he was, he was a guy who built us to build the community. And so I think Lamar would look at what's happening around the country. I don't think he would be surprised by it. A lot of conversations I had with him, you know, he was very aware of, the challenges that we were facing back, you know, 10, 20 years ago, when, uh, you know, you could see the world, uh, the country dividing more, uh, politics was dividing more, um, you know, but Democrats and Republicans weren't talking to each other. People within the Democratic Party, you know, are in 50 different camps and don't always play well together. I think he would say he could see that coming, but I think he would be extraordinarily pleased with the progress that we are now making in our city. Um, including at our university. Uh, it's easy to spot the things that aren't going well, but when you're so used to living in a, in a position where things are always a struggle, it's hard to see the forest for the trees, right? And so um, everything I've seen, I don't know any city in America, and I've been around a lot of places, I've done a lot of work that has made this much headway in the last 10 years on racial equity than in Madison, Wisconsin. And I really think we need to start talking about that. We're nowhere near where we need to be, but we've made extraordinary progress. And it's all the people that have come to this city, the people who have been here, um, and the young people that are coming up that are making these changes. And to give a, a few examples, like the city council being majority people of color in a city that's 75% white, um, in a city like Madison, I would have never thought that that would be possible ever in my life. Um, and these are all very competent, capable people we've elected. And this city said, that's what we want. We've got leaders in positions. We need more diversity and some more leaders in some of these positions, but we're building it. Um, we have people in, there used to be just the, 
the, the, the, the support jobs that we had in this community. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing people in more um, like a diversity of jobs, um, leading organizations, business, banking. We're seeing people in different places. Um, and then it's the, uh, the number of not just organizations that we're starting, but the visible presence of people moving forward and running for public office and starting and operating businesses and doing things for young people and being more vocal. And then the white community here starting to tell, saying, we we're going to get behind you rather than us always having to get behind them. That's a major change. And um, it's, it is, it's huge and it's growing. And so my hope is that uh, we continue to grow in that area. I take it upon myself. I have also a responsibility to show people as I, I as people are keep reminding me, they don't know any other nonprofit leader in Madison that started an organization has gotten as many resources as we have. But I know this. But I know people have also wondered, like, who is he going to hire? Is he going to be equitable in his hiring? And so mm -hmm. I take it very, I, I take it very seriously that I have to be an excellent business leader of a nonprofit organization. I have to hire people well. I have to promote them. I have to move them forward. I have to compensate them. I have to make sure that that their professional development is tended to. I have to make sure the people that we serve are getting their needs met and that I have a diverse team. I have white men in positions of authority, white women, Latino women, Latino. I, wait, I don't think I have a Latino man. I need that. I need that. Um, but we've got people. And it's not like we're going out here cherry picking and saying, well, I have these five people I need. Let me go find them. We're just casting a wide net and really working hard to find the best people. And by doing that, we're creating an amazingly diverse team. And so I'm trying to be that person that others are trying to be as well. And if we keep doing that, Madison's going to be an amazing place in the university. Nick, I say, he needs to start telling people all the programs it supports to help our young people move forward. We just need to start moving more young people into that pipeline so they can get on our campus and they can become those professors and doctors and people of the future. So we're nowhere near where we need to be yet, but we're moving there. Yeah, absolutely. I hear you. I think it is so important that you're helping us connect the dots. I think it's so, so crucial to understand where and how to look for some of those uh, feedback, support, uh, resources to move our uh, community forward. And not only that, but also support uh, our young kids and young leaders uh, that are on their way. Uh, as we wrap up, uh, Kaleem, I wonder if you can share a little bit more about next steps in, in your uh, future in uh, one city or um, anything that you can think of uh, as, you, as we finalize this uh, conversation. Yeah, sure. So for me, you know, I'm looking down the road. Um, we, we're going to grow our schools. So we have that stage to hopefully go to back to birth all the way through 12th grade. Um, we tell people, you know, we're, we're not the model. We're just a model, but a really important one that we're trying to seed these innovations so that people can learn from them and do them better than us going forward, whether that be within traditional public education, charter schools, private schools. Uh, we're not as concerned about who takes the innovations that we we implement, but uh, we are going to try to change state law. Uh, we want to see uh, early childhood education be free and available to every family in the state of Wisconsin. Um, anything that we would do to make that happen would be better than what we have now, where families, it's all on the free market for kids. It's all privately funded with a little government help for very poor people. Uh, we can't continue to build a model to prepare our kids like that um, at that early age. So we really want it to be free. And then we also want to see the state put more money into innovative models of education like our own and others so we can start getting better results with the young people so we can move them into these opportunities for a university and um, uh, business right out of school if they want to go begin working, that we can do that. People are complaining, you know, we have a low birth rate. We um, aren't seeing people wanting to go back to work, but we created that. We caused that by allowing millions and millions of, un of, of children of color to underperform in our schools year after year after year. And we can no longer sustain that because th we need those children to be successful to sustain what we're doing going forward. So if we just invested more in the kids that we have, we would deal with that birth rate issue. And second, if families know they didn't have to pay $1,200 a month for childcare, more of them would have babies, you know? So, so there's things like that. So I want to be somebody who continues to push the envelope there on education and um, 
start to see more policy change happen to actually institutionalize that change going forward. Agree. Uh, thank you so much for all of the, your wisdom and words uh, that are very valuable to me, to us at the university, but also I know many in the community. So hopefully this is not going to be the last of maybe a few more uh, conversations that I know we'll have in the future. Uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing. And we really appreciate Lamar. I know will be very proud of the work that you're doing and the work that we're creating here and the changes that we're creating here in Madison. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to do this too. Thank you. For more information about Kaleem's work, visit www.onecityschools.org and to stay tuned for our future community chats highlighting previous winners of the Lamar Billups Award, you can visit communityrelations.wisc.edu. I'm Brenda Gonzalez and this is Community Chats.